Hey everyone, so today's video is going to be covering 10 of my favorite writing techniques and I got this idea from my friend Shaylin. She did a video on her favorite writing techniques, so I'll be sure to link her video in the description, but I'm kind of a nerd for like prose and like prose techniques. So when I saw this video, I was like, oh, I gotta talk about some of my favorite techniques. So we're gonna be talking about some basic ones and then some also weirder ones. So let's start this video out with point of view. Point of view, I think, is one of the most underrated writing techniques and aspects of writing in general. I think it often gets overlooked. And in my opinion, I think point of view can make or break a story. Point of view is critical in how successful your story ends up being. I think that point of view can actually act as a character in itself and can add layers and layers of texture into a story that otherwise may seem flat. I used to default my point of view to first person present tense and it was because I didn't know how to write anything beyond that and whenever I did try to write another point of view it was uncomfortable, it felt difficult and that was because I was writing a different point of view, for example third person, with the frame of somebody who would write a first person present tense narrative. While obviously you can take things from different points of view and apply them to other points of view, I was kind of treating point of view as this thing that existed, but that wasn't contributing anything to the story. I was writing it in this way where I was writing like a third person narrative, but it was basically just first person. So when I started to acknowledge the differences, the nuances in point of view and how much that can bring a story, how much richness, how much vividness that can bring to a story, I began to much more appreciate point of view and how much it can actually add to a story itself. Like I said, point of view can kind of act as a character on its own. Obviously in fiction, first and third are very standard now. One that I think gets overlooked is second person. Second person is lovely, especially if you're a short fiction writer. There's probably a stigma in the way it's been described. The reader is being spoken to by the writer, which is not really how I would view second person at all. It's more like the character is referring to themselves. So it can cause like a really interesting, like hive mindy echo chamber of a story and point of view can add a lot of tone. So it's something I would never overlook. It's one of my favorite things to talk about about writing. So the next thing I'm gonna be talking about is my favorite part of writing. I absolutely love specificity and detail work. I'm a bit of a sucker for any sort of specificity at all, whether that's character, whether that's detail, whether that's like setting specificity, any sort of specificity I love. I melt at the sight of specificity. Specificity is where voice, style, and good writing in general lives. Good writing is specific, it's vivid, it is unique to that writer because they picked out the details they wanted to include rather than just leaving them vague for the reader to interpret. Some people prefer that. I personally think that a benchmark of good writing is specific writing because specificity is what leads to universal a lot of people's first instinct is to be vague, like she felt sad, right? And they don't want to specify what that is through concrete language, for example, because they want the reader to be able to interpret their story. I have a pretty strong opinion on that. I don't think that that's very effective. I think specific writing is where universality is because we can apply our experiences to the specific experiences of a character, but not everybody feels sadness in the same way. And so a character is feeling sadness in their own way. And so if we just generally generalize their experience, it can actually be a lot harder for a reader to tap into how they're feeling because we only know our own experiences. But I will be able to understand an experience that you specify on the page, for example. My favorite part of specificity is more to do with details. I love, for example, with plants, because there's plants behind me, specifying what kind of plant is that? The ones behind me, I think there's like a dumb cane. So I was gonna like laugh at me because she's like a plant queen, but there's one hanging up above me too in like a macrame thing. And so that also adds specific detail. I just love descriptions that are very specific. It makes my heart sing. In my opinion, specificity brings writing to life. It is where life lives in writing. It's all in the specific details. So I'm going to read an example from my friend Shaylin's short story, Cherry and Jane in the Garden of Eden, which is published on the Puritan. I wanted to show you some examples of some amazing specific detail. I answered an ad for a summer house sitting job and drove two hours into the hills to get there. I drove recklessly because I was the only one on the road. 
When the Spanish-style villa columned against the sky, I imagined a summer spent drinking rosé on the porch, watching crows shuffle in the pink dusk, the crickets popcorning in the underbrush. I'd need to invent a ghost or a serial killer so I wouldn't get lonely. I'd need to pretend I wasn't alone to keep myself in check, sane, watched. So I answered an ad for a summer house sitting job. Summer house sitting job is specific. It's not just a job. What kind of job is it? It's a house sitting job, but also it's a summer position. And then drove two hours into the hills to get there. So I love that detail because it's a, it's a little bit um, understated, but at the same time, it's very specific. She didn't just say drove two hours to get there driving two hours into the hills. So that gives more of an atmospheric backdrop for a reader to picture. When the Spanish style villa columned against the sky, so we'll just stop there. Spanish style villa is very specific. It's not just one the house. It's a Spanish style villa. It's not just a villa even, it's a Spanish style villa. That's very specific. I imagined a summer spent drinking rosé on the porch. So it's not just sitting on the porch. It's not just drinking whatever on the porch. It's drinking rosé on the porch in specific, not just sitting outside and drinking something outside. Watching crows shuffle in the pink dusk. So the character is watching in specific crows is a species of the bird and the crows are shuffling in the pink dusk. They're not just shuffling in the sky. Specifically, it's dusk and specifically it looks pink. The crickets popcorning in the underbrush. In specific, what's in the underbrush is a cricket. They're popcorning. That's a very, very specific verb. You can kind of hear and see that image. And where are the crickets? They're in the underbrush in specific. They're not just outside. I'd need to invent a ghost or a serial killer so I wouldn't get lonely. So the character is saying they wouldn't need to invent another person. The character wants to invent a ghost or a serial killer. Now let's move on to the third thing I love in writing and that's unexpected adjectives and verbs. So playing with the implied verbs slash the implied adjectives that are often connected with words. What I mean by implied verb or implied adjective, we learned about it in the context of implied verbs. So I will give that example, but I think the same can apply to adjectives. Using the implied verb or the implied adjective is not a bad thing. I do that all the time. But if there is a certain instance where you kind of want to punch up an image, playing with the implied verb can actually really help. We wrote down a list of nouns and then we wrote down a list of verbs that you would just associate with those nouns. And then we like scratched out those verbs and then wrote new verbs that are like completely different and subverting uh, the reader's expectation. Words do have implied verbs, for example. So the snow fell on the roof. So we always say, you know, the snow is falling to the ground. But what if we said instead, snow freckled the roof? That adds like a musicality to the prose that wasn't there before. And it also adds a little bit more style. I think that the same can also be applied to adjectives, such as describing a beautiful thing with ugly words, for example. Describing a bright blue sky as sickly. That will signal in the reader's mind, okay, so this typically beautiful thing is now being described in this kind of gross way. And so this can actually add a lot of subtext, I think, to your prose as well. So I have two examples here. and. These books I'm going to come back to just because they're like my two favorite books of all time. And so the first is an example from Eliza Robertson's Demigods. And so here she says, a bird shrieked behind me and I turned to find seagulls jousting over a crab shell. So the verb in that instance is jousting. And that's not the first thing that you would think of when you're thinking of seagulls, but it totally makes sense. But you can totally picture that image of these seagulls going at each other. And so I think that that's very creative. And another example is from Emma Klein's The Girls, which is my heart. I was happy enough to point out the bathroom when asked to parcel into a napkin of buttered nuts that I ate by the pool one by one. Their salty grit fleecing my fingers. She parcels into a napkin. She's parceling into the napkin. So parcel might suggest that she's like closing it up, but no, she's like going into it. And so when you picture a parcel, you can definitely understand what Emma's trying to do there. It's a very creative use of the word parcel. And that's really more interesting than like I picked up the nuts or whatever. And the second great verb here is fleecing. So the salty grit, like the salty coating on the outside of these nuts 
fleeces her fingers. And so we can really understand what that feels like. If we think of like the fabric fleece, for, for example, it's very soft, but it, it kind of like, it doesn't stick to your skin, but it has that noticeable contact on the skin. And so fleecing, you know exactly, like if you've ever eaten salted nuts and you felt a fleece, for example, you definitely know why those two things kind of correlate. And they're very creative and it's a lot more interesting than saying the salty grit coating my fingers. So the next thing I love in writing is sentence fragments. So this is actually something I used to overdo a lot when I was getting into my literary style and I got pretty into sentence fragments and things that didn't need to be sentence fragment were sentence fragments. And I think that's a bit of like a newbie mistake when you're like going into trying to utilize different sentence structures, but particularly sentence fragments. It's overdoing it in places where it doesn't need to have a sentence fragment. Sentence fragments are a great way to add flow to your work, but that doesn't mean every single sentence for you to have flow needs to be uh, a sentence fragment. Oftentimes it can just look a little funny if you just have a whole bunch of sentence fragments because you like that style. I would just be careful with how much you're using that just as somebody who like overused it for about a year and a half or so. It can even enhance tone. So it can add sort of this punchy urgency to the prose that I really enjoy. Learning to use sentence variations in general can add a lot of texture to the prose. So this one's a bit easy to overdo. There's nothing wrong with trying it out and then editing later. My example here comes from the girls. Again, this is the opening of the girls. The three of them were far enough away that I saw only the periphery of their features, but it didn't matter. I knew they were different from everyone else in the park. Families milling in a vague line, waiting for sausages and burgers from the open grill. Women in checked blouses scooting into their boyfriend's sides. Kids tossing eucalyptus buttons at the feral looking chickens that overran the strip. So it has this sort of whimsy to the prose. The prose in my head kind of flows like this. It's very smooth instead of being complete with those complete sentences. It adds kind of almost like a very lyrical, like as if you were writing out song lyrics feel to the writing. So the next example is in line with the girls. And that's because this is a technique that I've coined the Emma Klein. And so obviously this is not an actual literary term. Term, but it's something that I've kind of just like joked around with because it's just so good. It's one of my favorite things, probably behind specificity. And the Emma Klein is when you use an abstract concept, but then pair it with kind of severe language to add some thematic texture. And that sounds a little lofty. You'll understand what I'm saying when I read the examples, but this is something that I noticed that Emma Klein does a lot in The Girls. The Girls is my favorite novel. I love Emma Klein. This is one of my favorite techniques that she utilizes. And so here's the first example from The Girls itself and then I'll give you an example from my own writing. I was alone that afternoon, Connie probably fuming in her small bedroom playing positively fourth street with wounded righteous indulgence and in that case righteous indulgence is sort of what I'm talking about. It's kind of like a bigger theme indulgence but then it's paired with a bit of severe language, righteous, to create this kind of thematic, delicious parcel of joy that I can consume. I don't know if anybody else gets excited about this, but I do. So here's an example from my own work. This is from Feeding Habits. Though her expression unbends from severe back to her perfected mold of glitzy conviction, her momentary lapse into delicacy startles him. And so in that case, glitzy conviction, or maybe even a uh, momentary lapse into delicacy could count as the Emma Klein. I hope I made that make sense. So the next thing that I love in writing is something that I've coined the days. This is my favorite way to actually work around abstract words, concepts, and even themes. It's going from vagueness to specificity in writing. And I'll continue to explain it because this is not really a concept that exists. At least I don't know the name of it. It's just something that I've started to do a lot more often as I've grown as a writer. I, I would say this is a bit more of an advanced writing technique that can actually lead to melodrama or like purple prose if overdone a little bit too much. But I'll show you exactly how I utilize it. Not everybody's going to like it. It's a bit more of like a jumpy style of writing. So it depends on your style. But it's one of my favorite things to implement, especially when a character is supposed to be in a daze. 
So sometimes I use this in sentences, but I'm going to show you on a grander kind of paragraph level. But sometimes I will start with an abstract concept at the beginning of a sentence and then specify that um, with an example at the latter half of the sentence. Sometimes I might use an abstract concept and then pull in a concrete simile. And that kind of juxtaposition can create this very hazy feel. Again, this can sometimes cause gratuitous writing where you're repeating yourself like she was sad. Um, tears coursed through her eyes like a rainfall or something. That was a really horrible example. But you already, you could have just cut the she was sad part. So that's not what I'm talking about. You'll see a little bit more what I'm saying in the example. You're shaping an image before the reader. You're shaping an experience before the reader. Starting with something that's a bit hazy at the beginning and then clarifying it at the end with some very like punchy specificity can create kind of the days. You don't want to do it to create clarity issues, but I think you'll understand a little bit more with the example. So let's jump into it. So my example for the days is going to be again from feeding habits where Lonan is like stumbling out of a church uh, and a family finds him. One of the children, hair pulled into two plaits secured with pearlescent butterfly baubles, pokes at her mother and asks if he's crazy. Her mother shushes her at the same time her older sister shows him a cool trick she learned with a toy convertible. Its wheels were, Lonan gasps, the girl says, even crazy people think I'm gifted, and wheels the car again. Church bells gong and LG shirt he's heard before. The woman's sparkling water dribbles from his mouth and dampens his dress shirt. Sun eclipses his face and eats at his throat like a parasite, like it knows all the unclean things about him, a watcher, an eyeball, a scorching little thing that bullets through his neck like the tooth of a wolf. The woman shushes her children and asks if he's got a health problem, a drug problem, any problem. And he could say yes to all three, but instead keeps repeating, I am heartily sorry, I am heartily sorry. And when she does call someone, no one he knows, he leans against the cool pavement, cranes his neck to the sky and parts his lips so the sunlight fills his mouth. So in this instance, I've created a bit of a daze through a few things. So like I was saying, you can either do this where you have a bit of like a vaguer, more abstract concept and then specify it. And I do that in a few ways here. This scene starts with at the girl asking if he's crazy. And so crazy is an abstract thing. And so what I do here is instead of kind of pulling on these abstract things like he is crazy, he's so sad, he feels so upset. Um, Instead of going on with like the abstract things here, I pull into some action by saying, you know, the mother shushes her, um, the sister shows her the toy convertible trick and then says, even crazy people think I'm gifted. And what I'm doing here is I'm creating a bit of a string of thoughts um, and they're they're not super long sentences, but the sentences are very connected to the point where it kind of feels like one giant sentence. So we have specific details, like Sonny clips his face and eats at his throat like a parasite. And then I add in a bit of a list kind of a thing. Uh, like it knows all the unclean things about him, the watcher and eyeball, a scorching little thing that bullets through his neck. And so there are a lot of specific details now that are enlivening the word crazy and obviously creating a bit of a a garbled sense of atmosphere in the scene. It's kind of difficult to explain exactly how I go about doing it, but I hope that the example shows you what I'm talking about when I refer to the days. It's kind of sandwiching a whole bunch of details together to create this ultimate uh, sandwich where the character is feeling so many things at once that they're over sensitive. They're being ambushed by all of their senses. I've added what he's seeing. I've added what he's feeling with like the sun on his throat. And so using the senses to ambush your character in a scene like this while specifying and specifying and specifying as you go can add this really like hostile, severe environment to the scene. So the next thing that I love in writing is something I've coined the mini simile. It took me a really long time to figure out what exactly I wanted to call this. And that's because I don't really think that there is any sort of word in writing to talk about this. If I find out, I will let you know. And this is essentially a noun that acts as an adjective 
that modifies another noun. And so it follows an X of X construction. And I will show you what I mean with an example. So this is going to be from Demigods again by Eliza Robertson. 10,000 years ago, someone cradled this mollusk in her mouth and sucked a fringe of chewy meat. And so the mini simile in that instance would be fringe of chewy meat. And so it follows the X of X construction. So it's an of construction where you are describing, so fringe in this case, I'm very bad at grammar, I think is the noun. <laughs> so that noun, if I'm incorrect, someone please correct me because I'm gonna be saying the wrong thing the whole video, but you know what I'm trying to say, I hope. Fringe of chewy meat. So a noun, which is the fringe, is describing the chewy meat. So it's not just chewy meat, it's a fringe of chewy meat. So I hope that makes sense. It's one of my favorite things to do. I probably overdo it. I use of way too often, but it's just, it makes my heart melt. I love it whenever I read like an of construction like that. And here's an example from my own writing. This is actually a simile, um, but it kind of is a mini simile inside of a larger simile. And so it says, snow and slush dredge his jeans and the hem of his jacket. A street lamp filters him and the security guard in foamy yellow. His skin has numbed from sitting out in the cold too long and in some places prickles with heat like the fritz of pine needles. So like the fritz of pine needles is a simile in itself, but we have a mini simile inside of this simile, which is the fritz of pine needles. So I didn't just say, and in some places, prickles with heat like pine needles. I said the fritz of pine needles. Some people might think it's gratuitous. I love it. So it's kind of using another word to uh, describe a noun that isn't really typically like an adjective, like like green pine needles, for example. That's not what I'm saying. It's the fritz of pine needles, a fringe of chewy meat. So the next technique that I love is anaphora repetition. I love repetition. I love any form of uh, rhythmic prose. So I'm gonna read the definition of anaphora. So Wikipedia says, in rhetoric, an anaphora is a rhetorical device that consists of repeating a sequence of words at the beginnings of neighboring clauses, thereby lending them emphasis. So here's an example of repetition in general. So this is from my work as well from Feeding Habits. He is weightless when he stabs the cap of the rabbit's foot into the corner of the window so it splinters. Weightless when he inhales and pushes through the broken glass like it's Peter's gate and he's a step away from salvation. Weightless when he paddles through the water like a sunfish, his body ready for this good at this as he holds his breath. Weightless when the car sinks and his head breaches the water like an orca. Weightless when he opens his mouth to the storm and exclaims his hallelujah, his new beginning, his ultimate baptism. And so this is kind of a thing that poets will more often use, but I find that it's very, very good in fiction as well. As you can see, the word weightless in this instance is what is being re repeated. And it kind of adds this chaos and also enlightenment to the scene. Obviously, we're talking about weightlessness. Uh, at the end, we talk about baptism. And so weightless, starting each se sentence in that way, adds emphasis. So it's adding some heaviness to the word weightless, which is very interesting. And so playing around with repetition can often lend to some really great tone and some really great musicality in prose. And I love musicality in prose and uh, figuring out rhythm. And so it can kind of make the writing feel more like a song and less like writing. And that's why I absolutely love any form of repetition. So the next thing I'm gonna be talking about is patterning slash injection. Patterning is a term in writing. Injection is not, I will explain it. It's just something that I have sort of started to say. How I'm describing patterning slash injection is when you pattern a certain motif, symbol, or thing in a scene, but in a jumpy, deliberate kind of way that makes it seem like the narrative narrator is following multiple trains of thoughts at once. I think that injection in this case would be more of like an advanced patterning because it's not just like a motif or like a symbol showing up. It's more like the prose is kind of playing with the narrator. <laughs> um, and that might seem a little bit weird, but it's almost like the prose is kind of trolling the narrator on purpose and throwing in this motif, for example, uh, to cause emphasis on it, but also so that the character can seem like they're thinking about many things at once. And so the next example is from Feeding Habits and sort of illustrates that as we jump between orange juice, we jump between hair, it gets really chaotic. And 
And it reminds me a lot of this opening scene in The Social Network. I watched the opening scene. I haven't watched the full movie, but for a writing class and we were focusing on screenwriting. And so this was more a study in dialogue that we were looking at. But I think that this is kind of the patterning slash injection and injection is what I'm calling it in this case is kind of the fiction narrative equivalent of injecting upon each other's dialogue and I think if you think of it in a dialogue sense injection makes a little bit more sense it's kind of cutting people off um, coming back to a topic we just talked about five minutes ago adding on to a new conversation it's a whole bunch of uh, jumble when you're talking to somebody in narrative it's basically the same thing it's like the narrator is always keeping track of everything that's happening while also adding on to new conversations and so this is that example it can also tie in really well with the days um, and sort of creating this chaotic feel and so those two techniques used at once can be really helpful so I'll jump into the example before noon Lonan scrolled on the first coat of paint Anya shifting a Dutch oven of sourdough into the oven and Joey's on his second cup of apricot yogurt. Sun fizzles against the damp paint, cakes under Lonan's fingernails. Through Anya's bay windows, it floods everything, makes her apartment a golden little thing. So I said here, this is our first mention of gold. Eliza hasn't returned any of Lonan's phone calls since he tried dialing somewhere between the first and last half of the wall. It's obvious Anya knows he wasn't aware of the plan, which is why every few minutes she states new reasons for her forgetfulness with the time. Eliza ran into me in the hallway, and I'm so bad at hallways, she said while rolling the dough between her knuckles. So many turns. Brushing her bench top with more flour. Time as a mother is such a commodity. It's like, what's the down payment for five minutes alone? But Joey's worth it. Joey's always worth it. He's just magnificent. Can't stay away from magnificence. And then dialogue. You want some OJ? And this is the first mention of OJ. Lonan looks up from the paint blankly, focusing on Anya in an embarrassingly slow haze. What? Anya reaches over to the fridge and tugs on its stainless steel handle. It gives with a haunted sound, a subtle sort of groaning, and she emerges with a glass bottle of orange juice. So this is another example of OJ, which will continue to be sort of uh, feathered throughout the scene. And then OJ, she says, and shakes the bottle so the liquid froths. Oh, he says, green casserole in the fridge running low on OJ. We're low on that. So this fourth OJ refers to a previous mention in a previous scene of orange juice when Lonan's in his own house and they've run out of orange juice um, before this scene. And so a reader would be like, ah, um, here in the italics, he's referring to this note that he found from his girlfriend, letting him know that they're out of orange juice. Anya only smiles. She doesn't ask again, but instead fills the geometric looking glass halfway, pushes it across the granite. Lonan rises and presses a palm to his throat at the clock like thump there. So where are you from again? So we'll come back to this detail later when she asks him where he's from. She undoes her apron from the back with one hand. It falls a lilac clump onto the tile and she leaves it there only nudging it slightly with her toe. Her eyes are golden too. So now we're back to the gold which we mentioned above right here, golden. Even the silver parts are somehow gold, more gold. And then how much could she pawn off her eyes like those? Anya squints and there the gold goes. Gold again, focusing on him until she leans forward and plucks a strand of hair. This is the first mention of hair from his jaw. It sags with green paint and before he blinks, he, she's clipped it with a pair of kitchen shears. Then she says, you got some paint on you. Oregon, he says, Boston, New York. So he finally answers her question, which is like above here. <laughs> um. And then she says, what? He says, you asked where I'm from. Anya pockets his hair. We're back to the hair. He's sure it's a subconscious tick. He, she hasn't even realized, but still he wonders what she'll do with it if she'll send it somewhere to get scanned, bag tested, how much you can find out about someone with just a nib of hair. That's a lot of places, she says. You're basically transcontinental. So now we're back to the where are you from question. From her pocket, Anya's hand twitches. He wonders what she's doing, if she's touching the hair or flaking off its paint or simply flattening out her po pocket. So this is back to the hair again, disregarding what she said about where he's from. And so he keeps jumping around in his internal narrative. Uh, and then he asks, are you going to clone me? And this is now a new topic. He's just changing the subject. He gestures to her pocket. Anya doesn't look. I could. Why? You paint walls fast. You've got nice hair. Do you collect hair? Just from the people I like. 
Lonan sips the orange juice. Now we're finally back to the orange juice. It's tart and pulpy. He claws down his throat like a hairball. So that might be a bit confusing, but that's one of my favorite techniques to sort of um, jump around on the page. It creates this hazy feel um, in the narrative. It can also create a bit of a chaotic feel to a scene, depending on um, how many different topics you bring up. And so the last thing I want to highlight are lists. And so this is kind of relevant to anaphora repetition, but in particular, I want to give it its own space because lists have my heart. You saw it with the example with the days. There are some lists with um, a whole bunch of details that kind of smash into each other. You saw it in the repetition example with the word wait list. So I use lists a lot and it's not just when I'm describing something. I can use it in the actual structure of the sentence, but I think lists are also very underrated. I think that they can do kind of a similar thing that sentence fragments do. You know, the ultimate form of writing sentence fragment lists. So lists can actually add a lot of lyrical flow to your writing. It can enhance your voice. It can change the variation of your sentence structure. And depending on your style, you might have like a very long winded kind of lofty, more flowery style like me. And so lists in that case, can work to sort of add um, the smoothness to the prose. But if you use lists that are punctuated with periods, you can have a very jarring, like bullet-like kind of bullet spray of details. Um, and so I think lists can be used in many different ways. And one day maybe I can do separate videos on all of these topics so I can go more in depth, make things make a little bit more sense. But for now, here's an example on lists that is from my book. The backyard smelled artificially floral like orchids, two bros, the grassy melt of citronella candles. I've kind of used a fragment in the list, uh, which is the grassy melt of citronella candles. But you know, then I have other details of flowers like the orchids, the tuberose and adding all of these details like bam, 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 one after the other can really enhance the flow of your writing. And that's why I really love lists in particular. I just wanted to give it its own little section. I don't make lists for anything in my life except for my writing. And so that's going to conclude this video. I hope you enjoyed the top 10 techniques that I love in writing. Let me know if you'd like to see an in-depth video on any of these techniques. And if you have any questions or want anything clarified, let me know in the comments. But for now, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.